thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is Ismail Safi, this is Matt Barnes, and today we're going to talk to you about our experience with WSO2, uh, specific to identity server and API manager, and how we were able to achieve uh, deployment automation. Uh, before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about who we are. iGen International is a risk management company. We help our clients operate globally with confidence. We're able to do this by delivering tailored integrated risk management solutions so that they can um, mitigate those risks and improve their profitability. Um, if you think about it, information alone out there is not enough. There's, um, it's, it's getting inherently difficult to figure out what's real and what's not. So our global intelligence platform monitors the world 24-7 and uh, make sure that, uh, and make sure that um, you know, we create timely, actionable intelligence and customized assessment for our clients so that they can protect their assets. Um, at the end, we, we monitor the world 24-7, uh, help you prepare, monitor, and, uh, and respond to events such as natural disasters and civil unrest and terrorism-related activities. iJet Labs is the innovation center behind iJet International. This is where Matt and I actually work uh, as I, we were introduced, I lead the pro, uh, platform team, and, and this, that's where we do our research and development, and Matt leads the automation within the platform team. Now, before we go into WSO2-specific um, deployment challenges, things like that we had, we actually wanted to give you guys a bit of a context about what our challenges were before WSO2 and how WSO2 helped us overcome those challenges. So, Identity and access management in general was a challenge for us. It is a very complicated um, uh, area. And um, in the security track, if you've attended, uh, they had really good discussions about how to overcome those challenges um, with centralized identity and access management solutions. But um, in our experience, you know, before even we joined iJet, we, we had some issues with regards to uh, how we were dealing with centralized identity and access management. Our, Solutions at the time were, you know, purpose-built custom applications that did, um, you know, user management and password management, and we had credentials being managed locally. Over the years, you know, our user base grew, and this became difficult to scale because our client security needs uh, changed. Uh, the, you know, internet is not a secure place, so it became very difficult for us to. Um, meet those requirements because some of our clients wanted to do multi-factor authentication, some wanted to control how their password management policies were, some wanted to expire passwords in 30 days, some wanted to in 60 days, some wanted to do in 90 days, and things like that. So it became inherently difficult to meet those needs. So we knew that we needed a centralized solution that actually would allow us to you know, delegate that solution to our clients so that they can actually meet their own requirements and take full control of how their credentials were managed. Um, user provisioning was, a, was an interesting challenge for us because when a new client came on board, we would work with them and, and take the list of users they wanted to give access to our systems. Uh, we would put them into our systems and emails would go out. They would click on a link, go through a you know, manual registration process, create um, credentials and, and manage that. And you know, even though it worked for many years, it's not a very uh, user, uh, you know, a good user experience because it's, it was a manual step and you were creating another set of user, username and password that you needed to remember about accessing our systems. In some cases, some of our users actually had to do that multiple times because they were accessing different types of system that required to have them uh, different roles. Uh, our other challenge that we wanted to talk to you about was, uh, was the existing architecture that we had. Um, iJet started in 1999, and since then we've added many applications to uh, our portfolio, and they were built around a centralized database with a very common approach in early 2000s with a three-tiered approach where we had the you know, modal view controller layer and the business layer and the data, data layer, and they were really deployed into J2EE containers. Um, and over the years, our product team had ideas about expanding these products, and these products you know, grew to be something that they weren't designed to be. Uh, we started having difficulties in terms of uh, you know, scaling these applications, because certain parts of it were uh, being used by 
more than other parts of it, so it, it became difficult to scale because in order to scale, we would have to scale the entire application, and they were deployed into J2E containers like JBoss and WebLogic, and it was really just you know, doable, but taking time um, from us to, to, to deliver other features in our products. And agility is a big, big, big deal because you know, we're a product company. Um, sometimes the uh, best thing to do is to um, you know, eliminate or reduce your time to market um, duration. So it is very important to be able to take an idea from our product team and get it out the door as quickly as we can. Sometimes that's the best thing to do in terms of uh, get um, you know, marketing advantage over our competitors. So we noticed over the years that with this type of an architecture, it was becoming more difficult for us to be agile in that, in that sense. So um, we started our digital transformation a couple of, a couple of years ago. Uh, originally, we were actually running our servers at a traditional data center, so we've migrated uh, everything to AWS Cloud. What you're looking at is a very high level of our uh, current architecture. You can, see, um, you can see that we are using some open source tools like Alfresco, LifeRay, and, and, and GeoServer. What we did originally was to migrate all of our um, you know, J2E application servers into our ECT containers and, and, and we used the infrastructure automation there uh, using Ansible and whatnot. And we knew that this was the right time to start um, dealing with some of the challenges that we were facing, like the identity and access management challenge and, and the monolithic approach. So this is when we um, started uh, introducing WSO2 Identity Server and the API Manager into our architectural mix. Um, Identity Server was going to replace and has replaced our custom-built uh, user management and access management uh, solution. We were able to introduce it without disturbing our existing applications. Um, our existing applications were using uh, a proxy-based authentication, if you will, and we had you know, tens of applications. So when we introduced WSO2, we did not want to go ahead and you know, modify each one of those applications so they would speak SAML or OAuth or anything like that uh, because of the timing constraints. So we've installed proxies that would actually front um, our existing applications, and those proxies would actually communicate with the identity server and do the authentication, and then the proxy server would basically provide the required header values and things like that to the, to the application. For that, we relied on Apache uh, web server, and we've used uh, something called Apache Mod Melon, which is another, another project. So as you can see, we, we value open source. We appreciate that WSO2 is an open source, uh, you know, commercially available open source uh, company, and that was a really good, good, good fit for us. When we were doing this, uh, we noticed that we were doing a lot of configuration on top of the base installation of WSO2 because we needed to deal with user provisioning, especially just-in-time user provisioning to eliminate some of the um, user experience problems that we talked about earlier. And, and we've noticed that you know, before we know it, we had tens of difference of OSGI custom build, OSGI bundles that we needed to deploy into. Uh, WSO2, we did custom claim handler, we did provisioning handler, we're doing home realm identifier, uh, home realm discovery. Uh, we have, um, you know, step-based authentication, et cetera, to handle our local-based passwords and, and things like that. So a lot of customizations went into it, but it really wasn't a disrupt disruptive introduction. Uh, we installed it, and then we were able to just proxy everything else with it. API Manager, on the other hand, was, uh, was even an easier introduction uh, for us because we weren't doing microservices before. As I mentioned, everything we, did, we had at the time was monolithic applications, but since, since our transformation into um, more agile and, and, and this type of architecture, we've actually uh, written um, many microservices and started exposing them through the API Manager. And we've actually built um, you know, single-page applications and started uh, sunsetting some of our uh, monolithic applications. Um, so in the next section, I'm going to turn it over to Matt, and he's going to talk to us about some of the um, challenges that were around how we deployed the, not only the base installation of WSO2, but how we were able to automate uh, the, these, um, these um, configurations. Hey, uh, thank you, Ishmael. Uh, so, 
As this will show in the diagram, we have a very large uh, stack that we're working on, a uh, large environment, uh, some of it legacy, some of it new stuff. And a lot of our new development tends to move towards the microservices and the front-end web applications, less of it towards a lot of our legacy baggage. Uh, so something that we really wanted to be able to provide to our development teams was the ability to uh, give them an environment where they can develop, test, integrate uh, th their work in that was separate from uh, the other environments that other people were doing separate streams of work. Sometimes a team is working on a direct production patch. Other times teams are working on uh, something more closely related to the WSO2 stack. And we didn't want to have those flows interacting uh, if they weren't going to be released at the same time so that they could test independently. Uh, so something we really wanted to achieve was a uh, ability to rapidly bring up environments that were very production-like, um, that were able to bring it up quickly, and in a way that was not going to disturb other teams. Um, and so we accomplished this by providing what we call stacks in iJet. Um, it's a smaller subset of those applications that we saw uh, in the d document that Ishmael provided. Uh, so we bring up, uh, like Ishmael said, we were doing a lot of AWS cloud work, so we bring up EC2s and the ELBs and the security groups related to those and RDS instances for uh, a lot of the service backends. Um, and we bring up these environments separate from the others. Uh, and then we install our, uh, all, the, all the software we need, whether it's WSO2's products or it's our custom microservices. Uh, and then we integrate those all into one environment, do a little bit of uh, smoke testing, make sure that the environments are good, and then we can hand them over. And we want this all to be a very flawless, simple process. I maybe run a Jenkins job to spin it up or I click a button, something that is going to be uh, pretty rapid. So uh, this is sort of a small subset of that picture from before, and this is sort of what I'm talking about when we say the development stacks, which is really here's the WSO2 products, uh, you know, the API manager and the identity server. Uh, we have the API manager obviously split, split off as a gateway and then a publisher store separate. Uh, we don't expose the publisher and store at this time to end customers. And then the microservices and the database architecture in the front end, so that a team who, you know, wants to work on the front end uh, and they want to test out their new single page application changes, they can do so. Uh, and then we have a separate one of these if a team wants to work on a, on a microservice that's going through a major rehaul and it's not going to play well. Uh, so we accomplished the automation of this. Um, we, as an organization, we've adopted Ansible as our go-to uh, infrastructure and configuration tool. Uh, that was something that was already in place before we really started the work on WSO2 and it really made sense because we were able to reuse a lot of the work that we've already put in there. We had automation roles that would install Java or deploy artifacts or different various tasks that were very common across uh, our, the, the, the stacks that we're trying to generate through uh, with WSO2. So using uh, Ansible was a good solution there. Uh, like I said, the reusability. Uh, and it also plays really well with uh, AWS. It's got modules that uh, are great for spinning up uh, EC2 instances and creating security groups. So we were able to use that to provision the hardware that we're going to be needing. Uh, and then we take the base installations, uh, real similar to the presentations we've seen before, where we're taking a base installation, throwing it onto the hardware, and then overlaying our custom, uh, custom templates for the configurations. And the great thing about the templates, and I think a lot of uh, you know, these various configurations will support this sort of behavior, is that you can template one file and then reuse it on multiple systems. So we can uh, take things like URLs for our backend microservices or our uh, or, or like if in order for our identity server to talk to API manager and back and forth, we can per create these DNS entries and allow them to do so, and we can put one file with a templated uh, URL there and then reuse that file across the systems. Very helpful for us. Um, makes maintaining these environments much easier. Uh, and then, we, like as Ishmael, Ishmael was saying, we've put a lot of customization, especially into the identity server. So we use these same scripts to deploy uh, those customizations, those OSGI bundles, some web applications that live on identity server. Uh, we can reuse these scripts for that purpose as well. And then applying patches, just as we saw before, uh, before WAM, uh, we're taking those patches, we're reading the readmes, we're adding those scripts into our Ansible, and then we're uh, applying those on top of that base installation. Uh, I think Ishmael uh, can talk here a little bit more about uh, the customizations that we've done to the identity server as far as uh, creating service providers, identity providers. A lot of those things aren't configured directly on the file system, so we had to uh, take advantage of some of the offerings through the admin console. And I think Ishmael could take that over. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Matt. So um, identity server plays a very important role uh, in, in our infrastructure um, right now. 
uh, we've we've added um, many you know, clients who've integrated with us. You know, after 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 the launch of WSO2, we had the federation capability, so uh, we had tens of clients um, migrating to 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 federation. So for that. Uh, we needed to set up identity provider configuration once WSO2 was up and running. Uh, we needed service provider configurations for all the applications that we wanted to have WSO2 protect. Um, some of these um, existing applications required certain attributes to be exposed to them through uh, header values, as I mentioned earlier. So for that, we needed custom claims to, to, be, to, be, to be configured. Uh, because we use the identity server as a key manager, um, to some of our single page applications uh, in the API manager, we actually automatic, we needed to create users automatically in the, in the primary user store. Uh, we needed to do password policy management um, as well. So uh, local installation of WSO2 identity server is, is really uh, you know, very, very basic and you need to do all of these things to get you where you need to get to. So, and all of these things needed to be uh, automated for us uh, for, the, for the goals that uh, Matt already uh, talked about. Um, so, you know, you can use WSO2 identity server carbon console to do all of these things manually. You can go there and click on a service provider, add a service provider. There was a good uh, tutorial yesterday about how to do that. Um, you can use the console to do identity provider configuration, add your custom clays. It's a, it, you know, that's, that's how we started. We started using the console manually doing these things, and then we, we actually quickly saw that the, the console itself is actually a client to uh, uh, an exposed uh, services API. So we then got the idea, why not just use the admin services ourselves to build a utility that would allow us to do this automatically. So we basically created a Java utility, which is really a SOAP uh, client of these admin services. And then we provided uh, a JSON uh, template, if you will, that was managed by Ansible so that when we were bringing up a new stack for a new uh, you know, domain, we would use the JSON template and create an instance of it and, and feed it into this Java utility and it would actually build it on top of our existing base installation of, of, of WSO2. So here's an example of, of, uh, of that JSON um, file. Um, some of this may be very familiar to you, but it's, it's a very simple syntax. We, at the top, we have the admin server details that basically allows us allows this utility to connect to the admin services exposed at the port 9443 slash services. Um, resident identity provider uh, is a concept with an identity, a uh, WSO2 identity server. We were, you know, in this case, we're updating its entity ID, as you can see. Users is an area of users you can add. Um, since, since these slides, we've actually integrated Ansible's uh, vault for securing passwords and things like that, but that's how we started initially where the passwords uh, were part of this with this template, but it's been removed now thanks to the uh, vault integration there. Um, here's an example of um, service provider. Uh, uh, again, it's an area of, uh, area of service provider objects because we have you know, uh, tens of applications, so uh, each of them are um, uh, b configured as service providers in, in, in the WSO2 identity server. Again, the attributes are probably very familiar. If you guys are familiar with how the console and identity server works, you can see the name, description, issue, and things like that. And, and, and we can automate the claims. And we can also associate these service providers with a list of identity providers, because we do have a, a list of identity providers that we can configure as well. Here, um, you know, the same thing. We, we set up our identity uh, provider uh, attributes, um, set up our roles, take our incoming claims, map them to local claims, et cetera. Um, we, we can pretty much do anything that the console can now by, by, just, um, by, just, this, by just doing it this way. Um, so I'll turn it over to Matt. That basically allows us to um, in, uh, configure all of our RIS configurations. Next, we will talk about the applications and the API manager specific configurations. Go ahead, Matt. Right, so uh, after Ishmael's created some of these users, um, we have a number of applications and APIs which uh, we like to bring with us with each environment. Um, so we take advantage of uh, API manager's REST API for this. Um, I think yesterday there was a couple of really good demos of how people customized uh, the API store and API publisher using these uh, REST APIs, and we, we don't use them in customization at this point. 
but we're using them in our automation scripts in order to uh, take those APIs and add them into these new environments so that they're ready to go. Um, so it's essentially the same flow that you would do through uh, the publisher of the store. Uh, we're logging in uh, using uh, curl or Ansible has a, a git URL module similar to a, a curl statement. Uh, and we, uh, we, we log into the uh, store or the publisher and we create the uh, APIs or update them if they're already in existence uh, and then publish those APIs to any of the subscribers. Similarly with the applications, we uh, log into the store we create the applications and we subscribe them to whatever list of applications that they um, have. So we, we, we do this by defining the APIs. Um, or, originally, we're doing it uh, using YAML uh, because we're already using Ansible and it's all linked well. Uh, but we're adopting Swagger and uh, still in our uh, organization. So as we move forward, we're going to continue moving uh, these definitions into Swagger. Uh, and the REST API plays well with that as well. We can update those Swagger files instead of uh, pushing them directly as a uh, as header values. Um, and another real convenience that we found is uh, when we generate these applications and we want the consumer and the secret keys so that our uh, developers can work with them or our automation scripts can run against them, uh, it, it's helpful if we just reuse in our lower environments these existing uh, consumer and secret keys so we don't have to go through and get that randomly generated value and, and provide it somewhere um, in various places that it's needed. And instead, we have a SQL script that we just run directly against the API manager's database, and that uh, pushes out consumer and secret keys. Obviously, it's not something we're doing in production, but for our lower environment, it really helps us uh, get things going, and you don't have to make changes, uh, and you don't have to expect developers to come into the store uh, and figure out what those consumer and secret keys are. Uh, so uh, this is all great. We're living in an AWS, uh, but there's obviously costs associated with AWS every time we spin up one of these environments. Uh, it, it, we keep them for very short periods of time, but we are paying for those time periods. And some tasks just don't play well um, with needing an AWS environment. Um, so we've been moving to running local Vagrant installations. Um, so if a developer wants to uh, run uh, WSO2 in a debug mode directly with their IDE, they can link it uh, and, and run it there as well. So that really just reuses the same scripts that we've written for the AWS cloud. Um, a lot, like a lot of other automation uh, tools, you can reuse those scripts and just run them against your local host and we can uh, install the base installation, install the patches and do those things. Uh, we run a local PostgreSQL database within that Vagrant uh, instance. Uh, we can run uh, the tools Ishmael was speaking about, about configuring the IDPs and the SPs. Um, we can run that locally and push those and we can do the same thing with the APIs and the applications so that we get a small working local environment if you have the right hardware to run it locally and you just need to do some minimal things. Uh, maybe we don't need to pay for those AWS costs and, and, and spin up all this and then have to destroy it all uh, if we don't need to. Uh, so the results of uh, what we have right now are, are, are pretty great. We, uh, you know, we spin up these environments, uh, we walk away from the computer, have a cup of coffee, come back and they're ready to, to be worked on. Uh, we have some automation tests that are running against them uh, to do some basic smoke testing, make sure that they're ready for our developers and we hand them over and they can do whatever they want and then when it's uh, when they're all done with their, you know, their fork of their branch that they're developing against, uh, they can tear it back down and we don't have to pay for it anymore. Uh, a lot of real benefits here. Um, we have uh, the same set of configurations, like I've said, are used uh, across all of them. Uh, so if we want to, uh, if a developer needs to maybe update an API manager um, configuration, we could then run it against all the other existing environments and it'll template accordingly and we don't have to keep track of all those files. Uh, we allow the developers, obviously, to keep a devel uh, dedicated stream uh, specifically for them, which is exactly one of our goals that we were looking for so that they don't have to interfere with the work that they're doing. Uh, we have no manual changes on the servers, uh, or if there are manual changes on the servers, uh, they're going to get wiped out because we're going to rerun these configuration scripts on regular intervals, and if someone wants to go in and tinker and try something out, they're going to find that their changes get wiped, which sort of it brings about the immutable server com uh, conversation, and it, it really makes... Uh, you know, some people have to second think the way they, they, that they're used to doing things. And I think that's really good because when we move to production with these changes, we already know all the changes they were tested against with and we can push them accordingly and we don't lose track of what's going on in our environments. Uh, and that, that comes into the final step is keeping things in sync with production. You know, when we use these same scripts to update our production accounts, uh, we push our artifacts, we update our service providers, our identity providers, we push our API updates all using the same system to production. So everything's been tested and working in a lower environment. Uh, so what's next for us? Uh, I think there's, uh, there's a number of things. Uh, we need to better uh, integrate with that Vagrant. That's sort of a relatively new 
uh, concept that we've introduced, and it, it needs a little bit more work, uh, but I think it's, it's definitely a, a good change. Uh, it allows us to reduce costs and allows us to uh, get developers' environments locally that they can run uh, things in that debug mode. Uh, we want to continue moving uh, towards Swagger, as I mentioned. A lot of people during the, con uh, you know, the conference have been plugging Swagger, and I think uh, as an organization we agree that that's where we want to go. Uh, we're just stepping towards it still. Um, and I think something that we've been talking about internally is the ability to actually version these configurations rather than relying on a git hash of this is what these versions looked like when I deployed, but maybe actually take it and zip it up, store it with a version so that we can roll back, roll forward with a more, uh, more confidence in, in, in what we're pushing. Um, we also want more automated testing. You can never go along with more automated testing, obviously. And we had a couple of, uh, of interests uh, with WSO2. Um, with OSGI bundle deployments, we found that uh, you know, the, the, they don't support hot deployments in the version that we're working on. I believe that's coming maybe, I think they said, in Carbon 5.0. Uh, so that's something we look forward to because it would definitely help us with uh, our agile development. And uh, you know, Ishmael was saying he wrote this Java wrapper uh, that integrates with the SOAP UI, uh, the Carbon admin console. And I've got a REST API that I'm integrating with with the uh, application, a API manager. And if there was consistency there, I think that would definitely uh, help us smooth things over to use the same sort of language across all barriers. Um, anything else to add, Oh, uh, no, I, I think this is all we have.